In today's video, we're going to look back on some of the point guards selected from the 2017 draft and what their careers look like today. An interesting class with star players, busts, and busts who ended up reviving their career. I won't be going in the order of when they were drafted. You're looking at the best role player in the NBA right now, and that is Derek White of the Boston Celtics. White was drafted with the 29th pick in 2017 by the San Antonio Spurs. The most important stretch of Derek White's early years with the Spurs was when DeJounte Murray went down with a torn ACL before the 2018-2019 season, and White took the starting point guard role. Murray was the future face of the franchise, and White was just looked at as a guy who would spell minutes for Murray off of the bench. He wasn't a lead at anything, but he played his role well within the Spurs system, next to DeMar DeRozan and LaMarcus Aldridge. He had that crazy game in the first round of the playoffs against the Denver Nuggets where he scored 36 points. A year later, the Spurs re-signed him to a four-year, $73 million extension. So why is Derek White no longer on the Spurs? The Spurs traded him to the Boston Celtics at the 2022 trade deadline because they were rebuilding and wanted draft picks. The timing of the Celtics trade for White was perfect because this was right when the Celtics went on their winning streak in the second half of 2022. He's been everything they needed as a secondary guard. Since January 24th of this year, Derek White is averaging 20 points, 5 rebounds, 6 assists, and almost a steal and block per game on 48% shooting. He's setting 3 threes a game and only committing one turnover. He's been lights out as a shooter and is the best rim protecting guard in the league. It's crazy how good he is with and without the ball. You can put him in a pick and roll, use him in dribble handoffs, and as a standstill shooter. One thing I like about Derek is he makes quick decisions with the ball and without it. You rarely see him over dribbling or trying to do too much. He knows when to cut to the basket when Tatum or Brown are getting extra defensive attention. And he's possibly even better on defense. He's a good help defender, can guard his band at the top of the key, and he's probably the best rim protecting guard in the league. I can't think of anybody right now from the guard position that's better than he is at blocking shots without fouling. And the Celtics got this guy for pretty much nothing. He's done more than expected since Marcus Smart got injured. White is going much higher in a redraft. He would have been doing this type of stuff with the Spurs, but his skill set is going to be maximized next to star players. De'Aaron Fox was drafted fifth overall by the Sacramento Kings. He's the only point guard in this video that is still playing with the team that drafted them. When Fox was struggling early on in his career, it was partly because of his inability to score outside of the paint. He's the type of point guard that puts pressure on the rim with his quickness, dribble drives, he hits open teammates after the defense collapses, but his major weakness was decision making and shooting from the outside. At one point in the 2019 season, he was shooting 35% from outside the paint, and that wasn't much better than the 34% he shot outside of it as a rookie. Fox has always been the type of young player where if he got a better team around him, he cleaned up the decision making and got himself cleaner looks at the rim, he would break out. And six years later, we're seeing it. He's having his best individual season, and the Kings are having their best season as a team in years. He's never been in complete control of his skill set like this before. He definitely knows how to command an offense now. It's the details that are different. I really like when he does that stop and go to take advantage of guys playing on their heels. He's a lot more controlled as a primary creator. In the past, I understood, okay, he didn't have a good roster around him, not enough spacing. He was still learning the process of running an offense. He used to be not great at finishing games, but now he's statistically one of the more clutch players in the league. He's the best point guard out of this class. Markel Fultz was the number one overall pick in 2017, and he might be the only player I can remember whose pregame shooting drills were must-watch Twitter content. If you remember when he was drafted, Fultz was looked at as the best point guard in the class over guys like Lonzo Ball and De'Aaron Fox because of his scoring upside and athleticism. I believe at one point he was the only player in college in over 25 years to average 20 points, 5 rebounds, 5 assists, and shoot 40% from the 3 point line. Fultz was going to be the final piece of Philadelphia's future big 3 that was going to take over the East with Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, but none of that ever came to fruition. He was traded to Orlando after just 2 seasons. Markel only played in 14 games in his rookie year because of a mysterious shoulder injury and when he came back he couldn't shoot the basketball. And because he couldn't shoot, defenses treated him as the worst offensive player on the floor on a Sixers team that already struggled with scoring the ball from outside the paint. He also wasn't used to playing off the ball this much, he had confidence issues at the time, and you wondered, forget about being a star, you wondered if Fultz would ever just be a productive player in the league. Six years later, he's having the best season of his career as the starting point guard on an Orlando Magic team that's close to being pretty good. They aren't good yet, but it wouldn't shock me if they are in the play-in next year. The big thing with Fultz this year is he's playing with confidence and he can shoot the ball now. 
One thing Fultz is doing right now that I like that he didn't do with the Sixers is he's using his underrated strength to attack the rim and bother people on defense. We know he's a great athlete, but it's a different type of pace when you're playing a guard that is initiating contact on both ends of the court. He's just fun to watch on League Pass that wasn't something you could say three or four years ago. There's just a lot to like now with him. He's tough to stop in transition, and he's got a mid-range shot that he goes to very often. Unless the injury bug hits him again, I don't see why he's not the starting point guard for the Orlando Magic over the next three to four years. When Lonzo Ball was drafted by the Lakers with the second pick, he came in with expectations that he will have his jersey in the rafters. He was given the keys on day one. He was billed as a future star. Remember that summer league in 2017? He was the main attraction. He was the guy, one of the next faces of the league. The pace of how he moved as a point guard and his ability to keep everyone involved as a passer got people excited. The idea of Lonzo bringing the Lakers back as the main guy hit a wall about 18 months in. He wasn't able to threaten defenses with his three-point shot, he wasn't a threat to finish at the rim, he couldn't shoot free throws, and he dealt with a few lower body injuries. There were calls for him to change his shot release, which he eventually did years later. I feel like a broken record saying this, but if you're a lead guard and can't consistently break down defenses with your scoring and passing, it's very difficult for an organization to justify the offense being built around you. Six years later, he's still not the star some people in the Lakers organization thought, but he's made several improvements that made him one of the better defenders and role players in the league after being traded to New Orleans and Chicago, but he hasn't been able to show that in 2023. Lonzo Ball hasn't played in an NBA game in over a year due to a knee injury. On Saturday, we got this update. Lonzo Ball is still not able to run or cut. The expectation is that the team will come out after the All-Star break, saying that they are shutting Lonzo down for the season. This is crazy because he's only 25, has seen multiple doctors, and it's just like nobody knows why his knee isn't responding. Before the season, Lonzo even said he had pain walking up the stairs. I think the question we have to ask is, is his days as a high-level starter pretty much over? If he comes back, I expect him to be in a limited role on a contender where he plays 15 to 20 minutes per game. His lower body just might be cooked. It's also sad because he was coming into his own as a player and it was a key to a lot of the Chicago Bulls' current problems. The Bulls replaced Lonzo's minutes with Ayo Dusumu, who's not as good as Lonzo defensively and worse on offense. They also have used Goran Dragic, who's clearly years out of his prime. I've said in a previous video that this big three is fraudulent, but the role players are not good right now. Lonzo would be the difference maker. Lonzo not being on the court is holding back Pat Williams' development a little bit. He's someone that needs a pass first guard to play off of. Lonzo was their best passer by far, and his on-the-fly creativity opened things up for the Bulls' offense. On the other side of the ball, it's rare to see guards anchor a defense, but Lonzo and Alex Caruso are doing that. You take away one of them, and they aren't as formidable. At this point with Lonzo, you're mostly hoping he can just play basketball without being in pain again. Dennis Smith Jr. was picked 9th in the 2017 NBA Draft by the Dallas Mavericks, and they had high expectations for him because he was going to be a part of the new generation with Luka Doncic after Dirk Nowitzki retired. A normal opinion at the time was, once Smith and Luka get chemistry together, they're going to be a hard team to keep up with in the West, but they never ended up being good as a duo. Smith did not improve in his sophomore year and ended up becoming frustrated with how he was being used next to Luka. We knew very quickly that it was Luka's team and this wasn't going to be a rising duo in the West. Smith's career hasn't been very stable. He moved around to the New York Knicks, Trailblazers, and the Pistons in less than two NBA seasons. A big problem with Dennis is that he's a 30% career three-point shooter. You have a hard ceiling as a player if you're that bad of a shooter. He doesn't really get to the free throw line much either, even though he's pretty strong and athletic for his size. You'd want him to use his physical abilities to get to the free throw line five times per game and finish over people. It's weird because he shot well at the rim in college, but it didn't translate to the NBA. But six years later, he's finally having a revival season with the Charlotte Hornets. It hasn't been anything spectacular, but it's been his best season in a while. The Hornets signed him to a one-year deal to spell minutes from Lamelo and Terry Rozier. The one thing I noticed from him this year is his decision-making as a passer has been a little bit better than what I remembered. His three-point shooting is still bad. He had a hot stretch for a few games, but he cooled off. He saved his career this year. He's a backup point guard in the NBA as long as he continues to make smart decisions with the ball. Frank Nilakina was drafted by the New York Knicks with the 8th pick in 2017. At the time, Frank was labeled as a project. He was looked at as someone who could play point guard and shooting guard, but his impact might not be felt until the end of his rookie contract. He had the tools early on to be a really good defender, but he had limited offense. He just wasn't ready to run the point guard spot yet. 
and six years later he's pretty much the same exact player he was when he was in New York. The big problem with Frank is, is that he's a guard that passes up open threes and can't really create for others at a level to play 25 to 30 minutes a night. He hasn't really made huge strides as a playmaker and is not a threat to shoot. To be fair to Frank, he had to deal with multiple Knicks regimes, coaches, and was competing for minutes against Emmanuel Moutier and Alfred Payton when people wanted the Knicks to try and develop him, but at the same time, it's hard to play a non-shooting perimeter player. The Mavericks signed him last summer after his contract with the Knicks was over, and he was one of the more low-key surprises of the playoffs last year. He was asked to guard CP3 and Booker in spots and held up. The Mavs needed him in that second round series. I'm not sure what his future is, but he competes on defense, can spell a few minutes as a backup guard. For how long in the league he's going to be, I'm not really sure, but if he's on a team with a player like Luka Doncic, he can play. The second to last player in this video is Frank Mason the third. He was drafted with the 34th pick by the Sacramento Kings and even though he was the Naismith player of the year at Kansas, he was undersized at 6 feet tall which is why he fell in the draft. His physical frame just limited his ability to be an impactful player. NBA teams weren't sure if he could compete against bigger athletes and those concerns were pretty much right. He jumped around the NBA and the G League for about 4 years. He was the G League MVP in 2020 with the Wisconsin Herd. Most recently he played in Lebanon and in France. The last player I have in this video is Monte Morris. He was drafted 51st overall by Denver. The two big things about Morris when he was at Iowa State were his low turnover rate and high IQ floor game as a point guard. And that still holds true in the NBA today. He still has one of the better assist to turnover ratios in the league and is one of the best backup point guards. You're not really going anywhere if he's your starting point guard on a mediocre roster, but he's a quality player that's going to be in the league until he's 35. And that's it for me, just wanted to look at one of the more interesting point guard classes we've had recently. If people like this, I'll do this for another class or maybe a different position. I'll see you guys in my next one.